You're listening to Tony Martinetti Nonprofit Radio coverage of the National Conference on Philanthropic Planning. We're coming to you from San Fran- San, Di- San Antonio. We are in the state of San and city of San Antonio, Texas. We are not in San Francisco, California. With me now is Bruce Macus. He is a consultant at Barnes and Roach, and they are a consulting firm in Rosemont, Pennsylvania. His topic is building a legacy gift portfolio from your annual donor base. Bruce, welcome. Glad to be here. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, I love the topic because I'm not sure that nonprofits, especially uh, our audience, small and mid-sized shops, recognize that there's a potential for planned gift prospects among their annual fund donors. Um, just we'll, we'll have plenty of time to go into detail, but generally, how does that work? Well, it's really good news for nonprofit organizations because many, most, I should say, have... Um, annual giving programs and from that base uh, they can build a very vibrant and robust uh, plan giving and legacy giving program. So that is uh, a source of planned gift prospects that I think a lot of, as I said a lot, I think a lot of people don't think of. Um, in your in your workshop you're laying it out in in four steps and uh, the, the first is to create appreciation methods, I guess. You're talking there about stewardship. What, what do you like to see set up in that first step? Well, one of the uh, most important things in uh, getting a significant investment from a donor for a, a legacy gift or a principal gift, which can be a very large outright uh, gift, is you want to find engaged donors. And uh, your annual donors are engaged by definition, particularly the ones that have been giving, given for a number of years. And you want to find uh, stewardship mechanisms that further engage them, uh, get them involved, thank them, recognize them, show appreciation, and uh, uh, build their loyalty and uh, inspiration uh, with respect to your charity. Okay, so let's break that down into a couple of points. Finding engaged donors, how do we do that? In your donor base, you'll have a number of donors that have been giving for a number of years. Uh, Take a look at them, find them, pull out a list. That's how you find them. And then you um, can also sort those out uh, by people that are giving more or giving less, people that have been giving for 40 years, people that have been giving for 10 years. But essentially, you want to get the more more involved and engaged donors over time. And are we uh, concerned about a minimum gift level? Do these have to be large gifts over 10 years or 40 years? can be small, can be uh, close to your average uh, gift in your donor base, or could be very large, and those are, they have two separate kinds of approaches, but both can be very engaged. Okay, so so we, we will pay attention to people who are giving maybe just 10 or 15 or $20 a year, but have been doing that for a number of years? That's the wonderful thing about planned giving, is that um, anybody can make a planned gift, literally anybody, and... Uh, Planned gifts are the major gifts of the middle class. Uh, It may be the only time in someone's uh, lifetime or actually after they've passed away when they can give a significant contribution to a charity. And we sometimes call these the the ultimate gift to the The, charity. The ultimate gift. That's that's a good phrase. Someone would have liked to have given earlier but just couldn't afford it. Correct. Um, All right. So then in uh, identifying stewardship mechanisms... So if we've identified who the, who the good prospects are, your, your first step is putting stewardship in place. What, what, what specifically do you like to see there? I, I like recognition programs and also uh, involving donors in, in program activities. Yeah, you, said, you mentioned earlier getting them more engaged. Getting them more engaged. Things that will bring them to your charity, uh, give, them, give you an opportunity to uh, greet them. But if, if they are not socially oriented, you can still highly engage them, especially today in the age of social networking. All right. So what are some examples of ways that we can get them more engaged? How do we do it specifically? Uh, uh, events, program opportunities, um, sending them newsletters, in, inviting them to, um, well, actually donor recognition events where you can thank them in front of audiences, but just generally thank donors. Uh, and also today you can you can invite them to, to participate in uh, you know web-based social networking opportunities mm-hmm. okay um, now you said that there are different ways of approaching uh, high-level donors or smaller 
gift donors, both consistent and giving over many years. What are what are the distinctions between those those two types of uh, donor bases with re with respect to the recognition? That's yeah. That's the uh, the the second. Uh, <clears throat> it's actually the third step, really, oh. is to identify their financial capability. But we can jump there. I mean, the okay. second the second step is really to look at people's engagement level and to find your top 10 percent to find your next 10 percent and and to really focus on people right, that are more engaged all right so let's and talk then, and then uh focus on that well yeah when yeah. you look at the um uh sorting out your people by engagement level you really it, it's it's a matter of um looking at people that give high annual and low cumulative lifetime giving, low cumulative life, uh, high cumulative lifetime giving and low annual giving, or people that give high to both, cumulative lifetime giving, they've been giving for a long time, or, or uh, and also are giving a large annual gift. All right. Um, are, are there other non-financial measures for engagement? Yes, there's, uh, there are, uh, there's mission-based connection which is based on the program or the connection to the charity if you're a health charity they might be someone that's highly engaged because of the particular uh, disease or they're a grateful patient if you're a educational institution it might be an alum if you're faith-based it might be based on your actual denomination uh, they can be they can be mission-based uh, donors that that are connected due to they have a mission link and then you can also have a social engagement, which involves actually bringing people to events sponsored by your charity and uh, program-related or donor events. They can be any kind of event, any kind of activity, and getting them more engaged that way. Okay. Um, let's say a little more about these, these events. Do they need to be um, big? Can they be in someone's home? Is small preferred over big? Because maybe... Uh, or is big preferred over small? Maybe because that seems less off-putting to a potential to a to a donor. Uh, what's your advice around event uh, size and scale? Can be any size, um, as long as it's quality and it's a positive experience for the donor. Okay, um, but what about um, segmenting type of event based on giving level? So we have our smaller donors maybe have made lots of annual gifts but at a small level uh, is, is there a is there a type of event that's going to be more interesting and engaging to them yes that's a good point there are if you have the broad rank and file of the donor base uh, they can be invited to program related events to general uh, annual special events that that promote the mission of the charity and to help develop their loyalty major donors uh, can be recognized and thanked uh, with uh, perhaps a naming opportunity or a special um, special kind of appreciation in front of an audience that will help build their loyalty. Okay, um, you're, you're moving to what you've identified as your as your third step um, is to identify prospects by loyalty first and then wealth level. What what are we doing there? Uh, uh, wealth is uh, something that's public information, uh, at least a, an analysis of someone's wealth capability uh, can be estimated based on public information and, and you should do your best to find out more about your donors. Um, they, It's really good stewardship to know what person you're dealing with and uh, their background history, their financial capability. Uh, where they live and uh, what their capability is because you, you want to be able to approach them with proposals and stewardship that is appropriate to their uh, financial capability. Okay, so again, segmenting by wealth level and, and we're, we're ascertaining that wealth level based on their giving history but also external prospect research. Is that what Do you're recommending? prospect research on them, exactly, yes. That's okay. That's, that's, the, that's the phrase. Okay. And um, you, you said something interesting. It's, it's good stewardship to be aware of the, the backgrounds or the giving capacity of your donors. Can you say more about that uh, the, the, on the, the charity's responsibility around that? Well, I think an experience I've had is when you approach a... Um, donor of sort of average financial capability uh, and mistakenly believe that they uh, can afford a significant, a very significant kind of investment in your charity and then 
you make a request of them to, to do something very significant. It can be embarrassing and harmful to the relationship. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a donor who's, uh, say, in the in, you know extremely wealthy pillar of the community and you're approaching him for sort of him or her, really, for a uh, kind of average contribution, that can be demeaning to that person. So you really want to be have an appropriate kind of interaction uh, based on their capability. Yeah, I just like the way you phrase that. It's it's the charity's responsibility to act accordingly and solicit within uh, what we think is the the best uh, the best potential for the of the donor. I really feel you owe it to your donors to be to be educated about them. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Um, now you're you're. Fourth step is to uh, engage in proactive relationship development, and then and then solicitation. What what what's different about that step that we haven't talked about in terms of relationship development? Well, that's the one-on-one -on -one interaction uh, that you have with your donor after you have identified their engagement level and their uh, financial capability. You. Um, get to know them, you want to find out how they feel about your charity, you you uh, develop a trust. Uh, no donor of any level is going to make a significant, uh, send a, give a significant portion of his or her wealth to your charity without a level of trust in the charity. And uh, that starts with the interaction with the uh, officer and the, the, the fundraising officer as well as the leadership of the charity, other volunteers, other donors can develop relationships with the donor and build trust over time and then, uh, and then actually help realize a substantial gift. In terms of building that trust, what, what do you like to see if, if uh, there's a couple and let's say the wife is the primary, it doesn't really matter, but it's a, as an example, the wife is, has the primary relationship with the, um, with the charity. How do we bring in the husband so that they're both potentially at least engaged? Uh, and that, that can go uh, both ways. I think the, the husband can be inspired and feel very strongly about, uh, as strongly as, as the spouse, uh, about, about uh, the charity and the mission and the, and the issues. On the other hand, um, I find that philanthropy is frequently kind of an individual inspiration, and sometimes uh, couples diverge, uh, it, whether it's, it could be a faith-based uh, difference or um, there are all different alma maters, uh, different kinds of social issues that they want to be involved in. And uh, it, it's more important to have that relationship with the primary donor and also to obtain the trust and consent of the spouse. Okay, so then maybe I should have asked it differently. You know, should we engage the donor's spouse? And your advice is it really depends on the primary person's relationship with the charity. That's right. Okay, okay. Um, are, are, there, are there other things that I haven't asked you about around this topic of using the annual fund to support your legacy giving program? Well, my uh, my general advice is to um, look, you know, that the, your prospects are right there in your database. They're right in front of you. You probably have met a number of them, and uh, you can develop relationships and build a, a major successful legacy gift portfolio from a lot of the people that are right there. And and won't this generally be an easier effort than acquiring new donors? It's faster, easier, and uh, it's more cost-effective. Uh, people that are engaged are more responsive. And looking for new donors is going to take some time because then they have to become engaged, which will take time. Particularly, that's true, of course. We're talking about the legacy or planned gifts. You're not going to acquire a new donor and in the first couple of months have them including your charity in their estate plan. That's, that's not appropriate. Exactly. I've been with uh, Bruce Macus. He's a consultant at Barnes & Roche in Rosemont, Pennsylvania. We've been talking about building a legacy gift portfolio from your annual donor base. And Bruce, I want to welcome you to the show again, and thank you very much for taking time. Thank you, Tony. My pleasure. This is Tony Martinetti, nonprofit radio coverage of the National Conference on Philanthropic Planning in San Antonio, Texas.